Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, a violent police encounter caught on camera. I'm not on Get off neck. his neck! Accusations of excessive force after an officer is seen kneeling on the neck of a Vancouver man, witnesses screaming for police to stop. Forest fires rage across northwestern Ontario. More people desperate to get out as firefighters battle for control. If you thought the Americans were the only ones with a looming election, think again. The question becomes, which is worse, keeping them and this government in place or going into an election? The Bloc Québécois threatened to try to force an election here over the WE controversy. Can they pull it off? We've thought of every second of a child's day. And masks, face shields, and plexiglass pods. A Saskatchewan First Nations back-to-school plan that leaves nothing to chance. This is The National. Tonight, we are once again talking about allegations of excessive force in the police, touching on a very raw nerve. It begins, as so many stories have this year, a forceful arrest caught on camera by witnesses, this time in Vancouver. Get off his neck. Get off his fucking neck. The image of an officer kneeling on the neck of a suspect, all the more provocative after George Floyd was killed on a Minneapolis street held down by police. CBC News has obtained three separate recordings made by witnesses of the altercation. It all started when police saw a man on a bicycle allegedly breaking a city bylaw. Tina Lovegreen shows us how it escalated. Hey, bro, please. Please help me. This is a few minutes into a video shot by witnesses late last night showing the arrest of a 35-year-old man. Get off his neck! Get off my neck! Vancouver police say they were trying to stop the man after a bylaw infraction. They say he ignored them, tried to flee, and punched officers in the face multiple times. Immediately they got out of the car and then like slammed him against here. David Matatal and his friends were coming home when they saw the police cruiser driving down the street with no lights on. The bicycle drove by us and the cops were in hot pursuit. They were, drove down this, uh, this road here, uh, tried to uh, run the guy over a few times. They couldn't, they couldn't do it at like normal speed because there's cars on both sides. So they just gunned it and he went over the hood of the car. He says that's when he and his friends started recording. Two officers get out of the police car, immediately start throwing punches at this man who is not resisting. The man somehow ends up in the cruiser's front seat. Out of the car, asshole. And the engine starts revving. Police say the man was trying to steal the car. Get off the street. Moments later, more officers arrive, and one uses a taser. Taser, taser! The man, who has no fixed address, according to police, is in custody, and they're recommending multiple charges. The video doesn't show the context of what happened before or why police reacted this way. The knee on his neck. Why? The shouting, the physical force that is used when he is not resisting them. So those are very inexplicable pieces of this video. It was deeply traumatic. That's a person. They, he could have been dead. For what? what? What could have he possibly done? The witnesses have reported the incident to the police complaint commissioner, and an investigation has begun. Tina Lovegreen, CBC News, Vancouver. The wildfire we told you about last night in northern Ontario is growing in size and threat. The residents of Red Lake can see the smoke from their town. Officials say the flames are now just three kilometers away. It's a remote community, about 500 kilometers northwest of Thunder Bay. That is one of the several towns and cities where evacuees are being taken to safety. But as Karen Pauls tells us, even out of the danger zone, people are worried. We're actually got moved to the Valhalla. And Justin so Hutler is among hundreds of Red Lake residents settling into Thunder Bay hotels as they wait for news of their community. You don't know what's happening, and that's, I think, the worst part of the fear of the unknown. Water bombers, helicopters, and ground crews with pumps and hoses are battling a fire that's shifting with the wind and still not under control. 
It's now within three kilometers of Red Lake in the access highway. The red area shows its approximate perimeter. The strategy for today is to protect the, the north and west flanks of that fire, which are nearest to the highway and the, and the community. 3,800 people have already been evacuated, but not everyone is leaving, including doctors and nurses at the local hospital. In our medical training, we don't necessarily get specifics on how to handle these sorts of situations. This so doctor graduated from medical school just one month ago. She's sleeping at the hospital, which is empty, after all the patients and residents in long-term care were sent to other communities. We have satellite phones. We have something called go bags in case we have to service people um, in other places other than the hospital. Um, certainly with the fire being as unpredictable as it is, we kind of have to be ready for a variety of scenarios. Ottawa says the pandemic is also complicating the evacuation of nearby First Nations threatened by forest fires. That we're providing the supports and providing, uh, providing the, the proper evacuation protocols to ensure that people stay safe. Back in Thunder Bay, the evacuees are staying in a protective pandemic bubble. But right now, COVID-19 is the least of Justin Hutler's concerns. And we're just hoping that we get the relief and the luck that we need to go home to a house that, you know, isn't ash. That luck may come in the form of rain in the forecast for tomorrow. Karen Pauls, CBC News, Winnipeg. In Brazil, President Bolsonaro is once again denying the existence of fires in the Amazon, even as his own government says thousands are burning. His own government's data show 10,000 fires have been recorded in the last two weeks. Bolsonaro dismisses the numbers as a lie, adding that if someone were to fly over the region, they wouldn't see a single flame. A deadly train derailment in Scotland today sent smoke billowing into the sky. Ambulances rushed to the scene outside of Aberdeen. At least three people died, while six others are said to be seriously hurt. There were only 12 people on the passenger train at the time. And while the cause is under investigation, it is believed heavy rains and a possible landslide may have been factors. And in the United States, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris held their first joint campaign event in Delaware today. They spoke of democratic unity and a return to normalcy, even though the event itself felt anything but. Susan Ormiston explains. Awkward, this pandemic campaign, a quiet kickoff in a near-empty school gym, and a political love-in between two former rivals. One of the reasons I chose Kamala is because we both believe that we can define America simply in one word, possibilities. Harris accepting her secondary role. Joe, I'm so proud to stand with you. Kamala Harris sketched out her biracial background. Jamaican father, South Asian mother, who took her to civil rights protests when she was in a stroller. We're experiencing a moral reckoning with racism and systemic injustice that has brought a new coalition of conscience to the streets of our country demanding change. America is crying out for leadership. She blamed Trump as well for the disastrous course of this pandemic. The case against Donald Trump and Mike Pence is open and shut. The Biden-Harris ticket has energized Democrats, a record 26 million raised in 24 hours since Harris was added. Trump trying to drive a wedge, calling her mean and nasty. There was nobody more insulting to Biden than she was. She said horrible things about him, horrible things. And she mocked him, openly mocked him. We welcome the fight. Leah Daughtry, a Democrat strategist, says they're ready for sexist or racist attacks to come. And we are in a position now and fired up to take on the comments and the commenters as they come and make sure they understand that we are not going to brook that kind of discourse at this moment in time. We're done with it. And so, masks off, masks on, the Democratic hopefuls for 2020 and their spouses begin to shape this surreal campaign. So Susan, the Harris pick is attracting a lot of attention. We're even hearing some say she might totally eclipse Biden on the campaign trail. So how is that playing out? Yeah, commentators on the right are saying that Trump should be ecstatic 
that Harris will overshadow Biden and that she was a failed candidate in the primaries with little support. Biden made it clear today that she is the first black woman to run for the second most important job, but it's going to be a delicate dance. She's clearly comfortable with the attack, and many Americans believe that a vote for Biden this time is really a vote for her as a presidential candidate in 2024. All right, Susan, thanks for this. That Joe Biden chose Kamala Harris isn't just seen as a victory for Americans of color. Her rise is also being celebrated in her mother's homeland of India. Today, her uncle shared his pride from New Delhi. And I feel happy that my sister Shamla, her mother, would have been very happy and proud of her daughter. So it's a historic day in a number of ways for the Indian community. He said his phone hasn't stopped ringing since the announcement yesterday. And in her dad's homeland of Jamaica, excitement and humor. Kamala has a Jamaican father, tweets this human rights lawyer. As far as Jamaicans are concerned, we will be vice president. Kamala Harris also has substantial ties to this country, spending much of the 70s in Montreal where she graduated high school. Not that she talks about that much. Alison Northcott explores her Canadian connection. Kamala Harris went to Westmount High School while her mother, a cancer researcher, taught at McGill. Her smile and her generosity, she was a nice person. This former schoolmate says that high school experience likely helped shape who Harris is today. That school at the time, there's a lot of, a lot of Jamaicans and people from Barbados and people from India and Chinese and just like that. Because of the multiculturalism and her able to speak with people from different backgrounds, I think that molded her very well for, for the position she's in now. She has been quite, Kamala has been quite quiet about her Canadian experience. And he says that likely won't change during the election. Because it doesn't really get her much politically or, or it doesn't really sort of enhance her kind of position or her sort of um, posture in American politics. But he doesn't think her political rivals will use it against her either since she was born in the U.S. There is no popular hostility towards Canada in the United States uh, that one could tap into. I was raised to take action. I didn't grow up seeing somebody um, that looked like me in the political eye and that high up in office. That It, it, it means the world to me. This is truly going to be revolutionary. It's going to inspire so many other people to get involved in politics. Women of color, young um, girls like me who didn't think they had a shot. Although Harris's work as California's attorney general has been criticized by some progressives, some say she will still appeal to many. It's been quite a journey these uh, nearly four years with the current uh, occupant in the White House. Reverend Dr. Rhonda Britton is from the U.S. and lives in Halifax. To see a black woman chosen for this position in the land um, is affirming to the movement um, and it says someone is listening. <laughs> I would say good luck and don't let them push you around with you. They're convinced Harris can hold her own even if she has a tough political fight ahead. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Well, today the leader of the Bloc Québécois put the liberal minority government on notice. Yves-François Blanchet says he's ready to bring it down over its handling of the WE scandal. But as Evan Dyer explains, a fall election is nowhere near a sure thing. We Today, the bloc's leader said he's ready to bring the hammer down on the Trudeau government unless the prime minister, his chief of staff and his finance minister all leave their posts. Which is worse, keeping them and this government in place or creating a temporary distortion in the management of the crisis in going into an election? Did you have any communications with We Charity or the um, Kilberg brothers in the month of March? No, we did not. As Liberal cabinet ministers testified before the Finance Committee on the WE Affair, Conservative leadership candidate Erin O'Toole was also musing today about a vote of no confidence. I think this is a tired and scandal-plagued, ethically challenged government that soon needs to be put out of its misery. But for all the talk of bringing down the government, can the opposition really do it? And do they really want to? Well, the Conservatives are the official opposition, but they don't have enough seats to bring down the government on their own. They would need the support of the Bloc Québécois and the New Democrats as well in order to all three of them team up and defeat the Liberals. But the opposition parties today hardly looked ready to work together.
we have as little discussions as possible with the NDP, which doesn't seem to be very worthy of it. And as the bloc disparaged the NDP, the Conservatives bashed the bloc. In fact, we're going to be leading the process because the bloc Quebecois can never form national government. They've backed the government at times when they should not have. Although the government has lost some of the support it picked up during the pandemic, polls suggest that if last October's election were replayed today, the Conservatives might well emerge with fewer seats than they have now. The NDP would also struggle to increase its seat count and is also very short of money. Only the bloc might have a motive to really want a new election, and alone the bloc can't make that happen. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Gatineau, Quebec. Andrew Scheer marked a milestone today. It was his last time in the House of Commons as leader of the opposition. His final question challenged the Prime Minister to sue him for the number of times he's accused Justin Trudeau of corruption. After next week, my calendar is wide open. <laughs> could the Prime Minister please tell me when I could expect to see him in court? The Prime Minister wasn't in the House today, though. Scheer's replacement as Conservative leader will be decided in just over a week. Now let's check in on Canada's fight against COVID-19. British Columbia recorded 85 new cases. That's the largest daily jump since April. And the latest sign that the province once held up as a model of COVID control could be slipping backwards. Here are the other notable figures. 16 new cases in Manitoba, 121 in Alberta, and 95 each in Quebec and Ontario. Today, one corner of Ontario joined the rest of the province with stage three of its reopening. The Windsor-Essex region had been held back in part because of outbreaks on farms. Jason Vio looks at whether those are really under control. Control, tempo down. Today definitely feels like Christmas Day for me. Gyms can finally open their doors in this region for the first time since March. This owner took on government loans to stay afloat. It's been a big struggle as, uh, as the business owner, um, to be frank. Restaurants can now serve people indoors, but this breakfast spot had to slice its capacity by half. It's a new way of living. I mean, all this is new to everyone. Um, it's definitely taken a toll on us emotionally and to our business. But, you know, we're just, we're going to get back in there. It's not just small business that's struggling. This casino, Windsor's second largest employer with 2,300 workers, was allowed to reopen today, but didn't. The casino is asking the province to amend the 50-person cap for a casino like Caesars with a large amount of floor space. That's, you know, like a 6% capacity right across the ditch from us in Detroit. Uh, you know, they, they have a 15% capacity at that point. I don't want to compare us to the United States, however, um, you know, 6% is still on the low end. But in recent weeks, it's farms that have been the main focus of COVID-19 concerns. More than 1,100 workers tested positive, about half of the total cases in Windsor-Essex. The local medical officer of health says that situation appears to be under control, with just nine new cases reported today, none of them from farms. But one migrant worker advocate says many issues remain. The problem is that some employers doesn't want to test their workforce because if these workers tested positive, means that they have to slow down the, product, the operation, productivity, and in some cases, shut down their operations. Ontario Premier Doug Ford has pleaded with farm owners to cooperate and their workers to get swabbed, but Ontario Health tells CBC News only 55 of the region's 176 farms have opted for the voluntary testing, something Escobar says is a big problem. Jason Vio, CBC News, Windsor, Ontario. BC is hiring 500 extra people on a temporary basis to help with contact tracing. We expect many will be retired nurses and other healthcare professionals, as well as recent graduates. So their job will be to reach out to people who test positive for the virus to find out where they've been and who they might have come into contact with, all with a view to curbing community transmission. Indigenous Services Canada will provide $305 million in additional allocations to communities. That's new funding from the federal government for Indigenous communities to fight COVID-19. Ottawa says it wants to support local initiatives that help manage the pandemic, both on reserves and for organizations supporting those living off reserve. The countdown to the classroom is on. We have a gun to our head saying, take your kids to school. Up next, the anxiety, the uncertainty, and the pressure some parents and teachers are feeling. I don't want my kids to have a respiratory problem or a heart problem 
in the future because of a decision I made. People say we're going to the extreme here, but I think the health and safety of our children is paramount. Plus, the lengths one First Nation is going to keep the classroom safe. So these are the sugar cubes. We're not going to call them your cage. And expert answers to your questions, from changing bubbles to changing your kids' clothes, are doctors on your classroom concerns. Special back-to-school coverage right after the break. We're back in two. Keeping kids out of class in the spring was a challenge for many parents, but preparing to send them back is proving to be a minefield. With the countdown now on, there is fear, there's, there's anxiety, and a whole lot of uncertainty about what that return will look like and when it will happen. Even today, dates shifted. British Columbia outlined its new back-to-school plan, pushing back the start date. But as Susanna De Silva tells us, that is not fixing all the concerns. It's a prospect that has led to many a sleepless night. I feel like as parents, we have a gun to our head saying, take your kids to school, despite what you're feeling. Samin and Asif Banji say they simply do not feel comfortable with BC's plan for a full-time return to classes, even with a two-day delay to the start of the year. We don't know the long-term effects. I don't want my kids to have a respiratory problem or a heart problem in the future. We can't sacrifice 18 months of education. We have to learn how to do things safely during this pandemic. Teachers will be back September 8th, students back by September 10th for orientation. I think it's wise. You really need to be in the physical space to understand, you know, what spaces are we going to appropriate for, for classrooms? How are we going to distance kids? How are we going to improve ventilation, uh, stagger lunch breaks, cohort classes? All of this takes a lot of planning. Circumstances are different in every country, but there are lessons to be learned and mistakes to avoid. Denmark successfully returned to classes in the spring, focused on physical distancing, even if it meant new venues, small groups and outside activity. Israel is a cautionary tale. When schools reopened with next to no precautions in the spring, community transmission was low. We had a kid that is a super spreader. And because of it, we have like 150 kids were infected, like 25 teachers. We, we had like 25 schools that were closed. While Mexico was taking a totally different approach, no in-person classes yet, all broadcast instead on major TV networks. Every country, even city, is unique, say health officials, but there is fear just about everywhere. In Toronto, that pushed some to protest. This government is making a decision not to fund safe schools for our children. And many are worried no amount of planning will be enough. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Now in Ontario, there are supposed to be more teachers, more custodians and more nurses to help schools deal with new COVID-19 safety protocols. But as Deanna Sumanak-Johnson tells us, with only weeks to go now, the hiring is only just getting underway. By the time these schools reopen, they will look quite a bit different. To make parents of elementary students feel safer, this administrator says a lot more teachers will have to be hired than the additional province-wide funding of $30 million allows. If we were to uh, reduce the class sizes uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 or 20 students, uh, we would certainly need more than the uh, full amount that the province has uh, provided. And with three weeks left till schools start, time is running out. This young teacher looking for work has seen just a handful of postings. You would hope that the hiring process is, is done properly, uh, equitably and, and um, fairly. That takes time and I don't feel like there's enough time. There are also nurses to be hired and deployed to schools and today an update. We have a call out right now for, for nurses. We want to make sure we fulfill the, the 500 uh, positions without uh, draining from the system. The Registered Nurses Association of Ontario welcomed the idea that public health units will be in charge of hiring them. For them collectively to have the capacity to uh, assist, but then embedded in the different public health units so they are part of the team, right, um, it will be tremendous. The plan to hire 900 extra custodians is further along. Some jobs have been posted, but there are concerns. 900 custodians seems like a lot of people, but you're talking about 4,800 schools across the province. 
that's not enough for, for the amount of cleaning that we need to do for our students. In the past week, Premier Doug Ford said he would consider giving more money and time for schools to reopen safely, but no firm commitments were made. As the province, school boards and families grapple with perhaps the trickiest act of pandemic life yet. Deanna Sumanak Johnson, CBC News, Toronto. In Saskatchewan, one First Nation is taking its COVID prevention measures to a whole other level to try to keep its students healthy. Bonnie Allen shows us what back to school will look like on Pasqua First Nation. Only authorized visitors are allowed into Pasqua First Nation these days. Hi, good morning. Hi there, how are you? The tight-knit community of 800 people hasn't had a single case of COVID-19. Still, at the local school, Chief Matthew Pegan says 200 students will face strict measures from day one. I don't want to do steps. If there's a case, this is what we'll do. If there's two cases, this is what we'll do. Well, why can't we prevent that right away in the immediate and go to the extreme? The class sizes will be cut in half with 15 students at most in a room. They will alternate days learning virtually from home every other day. And each desk has a plexiglass barrier. So these are the sugar cubes. Uh, we've been playing around with what we'll name them so that the students will like to sit at them. We're not going to call them your cage. Pasqua First Nation owns a manufacturing company that's been able to build the plexiglass barriers and other equipment. They're telling us what they need to go back to school. We're rapidly prototyping it here at our facility at Pro Metal. It's made portable hand washing stations and touchless sanitation stands for each classroom. And then they'll wipe their hands. Students will wear disposable masks on the bus, but the moment they enter the school, they will be given a clean cloth mask that will be color-coded by grade to help the teachers keep the group separate. I'm excited for sure, um, but of course still a little nervous. Principal Christina Johns knows they can't control everything. Especially the little ones, kindergarten grade one, where they still love to hug their teacher. How do you, how do you get away from that, you know, and still... Um, make them feel loved and safe. The director of education says an elder taught her an important lesson that she's applying here. We're not to fear COVID-19. We are to respect it. And that's what they will teach the children. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Pasqua First Nation. Okay, when we come back, answers to your questions. I don't want to put my son on the front lines. The anxiety and uncertainty is real. So what's a safe way to get kids back to class? Next, we get into the nitty-gritty questions like, I have two grandchildren that are in my bubble. We've had lots of close contact over the summer. Once they're back in school, will I still be able to see and spend time with them? That's a toughie. Back right after this. I don't want to put my son on the front lines. It's a dilemma so many parents are facing, whether to let their kids go back to school during a pandemic. It just doesn't feel safe enough to do so right now. While some school boards are planning for staggered class times, mandatory masks for older kids, and physical distancing signs in the hallways, will it be enough to keep students and teachers safe? So joining me now to answer your questions, two infectious diseases specialists, Dr. Susie Hoda and Dr. Srinivas Murthy. Uh, hello to the both of you. Dr. Murthy, maybe you could take the first question for us. Here it is. Should sure. teachers adopt the same routine that healthcare workers are doing, such as taking work clothes off in one part of the house and immediately washing them? Uh, yeah, remember that healthcare workers changed their clothes primarily because they were providing care to patients with confirmed or suspected COVID-19 a very different situation from teachers or others where the risk of exposure is much, much lower. So at this point, we wouldn't recommend that all teachers or others who work in schools to take that level of precaution when changing their clothes, with changing their clothes and washing them before entering the house. Dr. Hodo, is that advice that you would uh, agree with? I absolutely agree with that. Um, I, I think that they're very different situations, so, so I don't think that it's important to have that kind of routine. All right, maybe you can take this next question first as well. How easily can the virus be transferred from clothing to people? So along the same lines, but this person says, I'm thinking specifically when a child may be releasing droplets in the air as they talk or shout or when they accidentally sneeze on another person. 
Right, so one of the good pieces of the news is that we're learning over time that the virus doesn't seem to really last on surfaces for that long, and particularly on clothing or softer surfaces. So for this to really be a realistic mechanism of, of getting infected, you would need to be pretty heavily soiled on your clothing with that cough or sneeze, and then touch that fairly soon afterwards, and then touch your eyes, nose, or mouth, so you can transfer it to surfaces that you get infected through. So I think it's possible, but it's unlikely, especially if you're gonna be wearing a mask while teaching. Um, but to me, it's a reminder of how important it is to just clean your hands frequently because you can interrupt that change of chain of transmission just by washing your hands. Right, okay. Uh, Dr. Murthy, maybe you can take this next question. Is a student more likely to come into contact with the virus in a small, enclosed classroom with unmasked students or in an open hallway with masked students? Yeah, so what we know about sort of large-scale spreading events is that closed spaces, lots of people, poor ventilation, no masks are all situations where transmission would be. Um, open spaces with masks would, I guess, be a lower risk of exposure than the small enclosed space without masks. That being said, there are ways of limiting that risk in that small enclosed space with distancing and improved ventilation in that space. Right, and, and I guess, Dr. Hoda, I'm thinking I'm, uh, the, the duration of exposure matters there too, right? I mean, you're sitting in a classroom a lot longer than you are in the hall. Yeah, absolutely. It's a multiple, it's multiple factors that actually uh, increase your risk. So it's the duration, the number of people, the concentration of the people in that room, uh, how big the room is, all of that ventilation is mentioned earlier. So, you know, I think transient passage within a hallway, especially if you're wearing masks, seems to be a fairly low risk um, uh, situation compared to sitting in a classroom for hours. Okay, uh, Dr. Hoda, this is a, a really, really important question that I've heard over and over again. I have two grandchildren that are in my bubble. We've had lots of close contact over the summer. Once they're back in school, will I still be able to see and spend time with them? This is a really tough question. Um, and it's because, you know, we're still meant to keep fairly small social bubbles to limit the risk of transmission. But just by having children come back to school, we're inevitably gonna increase their social bubble size. And by extension, that's gonna to apply to their immediate family. Um, so, you know, my personal feeling is, I think we're gonna to have to reconsider what we do with social bubbles as we move forward with schools reopening. And I suspect that that's gonna be guided by what's actually happening in terms of COVID-19 community transmission at the time. But of course, we'll take the lead from our public health authorities. I would say in the meantime, as we're trying to understand how things will look as we reopen schools, it'll be uh, still possible to have these kinds of visits, but important to maintain physical distancing as well as, you know, uh, hopefully be outdoors or in settings that are lower risk. And this is a big one. So Dr. Murthy, I wanna ask you the same question. I mean, and uh, like if you're a grandparent trying to make that decision, right? A teenager has gone back to school, is the bubble burst? I mean, yes or no? In a way, our bubbles have expanded with going back to school. And I think everyone's individual acceptance of risk is going to be different. As Dr. Hoda mentioned, a lot of this is going to be driven by how much virus is out there in our communities. Um, and our tolerance of risk will obviously change as those numbers change. All right. Uh, tough question. I appreciate uh, though your answers to them. Dr. Hoda, Dr. Murthy, thanks so much for your time. And hey, if you've got questions that you'd like our doctors to answer, send them our way on Instagram. We are at CBC The National, or you can send us an email at covid at cbc.ca. And when we come back, major changes to the world we live in. A global warming event, an iceberg nearly the size of Vancouver breaks off a Canadian ice shelf. And an international effort to clean up a thousand tons of oil in the Indian Ocean. The Canadians trying to help Next. The last fully intact ice shelf in the Canadian Arctic has now collapsed in northern Nunavut. It sat along the edge of Ellesmere Island for 4,000 years. In these satellite images taken just last month, more than 40% of the area disintegrated in just two days. For reference, that massive chunk of ice falling off is almost the size of Vancouver. Experts say climate change is linked to a drastic decline in ice shelves. And now to another environmental disaster, this time in Mauritius. The African island nation located east of Madagascar is dealing with an oil spill on its southeast coast. More than two weeks ago, a ship carrying fuel oil struck a coral reef. It began leaking last Thursday. 
Now, officials say they've now managed to pump most of the remaining fuel out of the ship before it breaks apart, but not before a thousand tons spilled into the ocean. As Tashana Reed tells us, the race to clean up the spill is very much underway, and there's help from Canadian volunteers. 1,000 tons of thick oil released into pristine waters. This Japanese ship to blame after it ran aground just off the coast of Mauritius. Now the island left to deal with the disaster. Hans Dawar from Vancouver was in Mauritius visiting his brother. Now he joins cleanup efforts. For myself, I grew up in this area and right now I'm seeing all this like damage is being done and being helpless is, you don't, you don't want to be helpless in this kind of situation. Countless volunteers across the coastline have been racing to soak up the oil using improvised booms made of sugarcane leaves and hair. Just another blow to the country's economy in the wake of COVID-19. It's a country that depends on the tourism, tourism industry, which means that we can't have tourism coming in. And then the fishermen, the only way for them to earn a living is to actually go out there and to try to fish. Another major concern is the impact on wildlife. Time is of the essence in containing the spread of the oil. The longer uh, it takes to install the boom, the greater the spread of the oil. There are questions why action didn't come sooner when the ship first ran aground 12 days before the ship began to leak. Today, the island's prime minister said they've almost removed all the oil from the ship and are demanding compensation from the owners of the ship. Here in Canada, the Mauritian community has been watching the situation closely. What we feel is that we are helpless because we're very far away, but our heart is still there. Community members are working to raise funds to send a skimmer, equipment that removes oil off the water surface. We do think that it's going to get better. Maybe not six months from now, maybe a year or two, but we're going to come out together out of this. Now all they can do is hope that things don't get worse. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Well, still ahead on The National, a moment shared by a couple of strangers and then millions more online. I think it's hilarious, honestly. I did not expect it to blow up at all. <laughs> the story behind this viral video coming up. We have learned that uh, some employers have put productivity first meaning that these workers uh, didn't get the opportunity to be tested. Well, as we told you earlier, the lack of testing among migrant farm workers is one reason for worry, as the southwestern corner of Ontario joins the rest of the province in getting to stage three of reopening. Earlier this summer, Jonathan Gatehouse investigated the state of COVID-19 precautions in Leamington, Ontario, and what those migrant workers have had to endure. Here's another look. COVID-19 has temporarily closed the doors of their Mexican restaurant, but the work hasn't stopped for Susanna Penner and her daughter Tanya. They've been up since 5 a.m. cooking meals for migrant workers. They'll spend the next two hours dropping off food for 400 workers in the area. Tanya and Susanna are two of the few people allowed onto the farms during the outbreak. They're hearing the workers' worries. Many complain about the strict lockdowns imposed to control the spread of the disease. So some of them are really worried what's going to happen. They feel like they have no rights, that everything has been taken away from them, that they're here, like some of them feel like that they're prisoners. Last week, the province started testing migrant workers at their farms, promising job protection for anyone who ends up in quarantine. But Ontario's plan doesn't cover undocumented workers, an open secret around town with hundreds, if not thousands, in the area. Farm laborers who aren't here on government permits, hired instead via temp agencies and fly-by-night recruiters who shuffle them from farm to farm, taking a big cut of their pay. Rahelio Munoz Santos, a 24-year-old from Mexico, died after testing positive for COVID-19. He came to Canada on a tourist visa. This man worked with Rogelio in a greenhouse. We're calling him Juan to protect his identity because he too is undocumented. Their jobs were arranged by a Canadian recruiter. Their wages paid in cash. Their safety overlooked. We started to get sick, he says. 
all of us, but with different symptoms. We knew that we had the coronavirus. They abandoned me. They never gave me anything, he says. Same with Rogelio. They also abandoned him. Santiago Escobar is an advocate for migrant workers. He estimates that at least 2,000 farm laborers in Windsor, Essex, lack the proper paperwork. Undocumented workers are more vulnerable because they don't have um, status, so-called legal status. They don't have access to the healthcare system. This undocumented man is from Guatemala. He came here on a temporary foreign worker permit, but when it expired, he stayed. We're protecting his identity because he's afraid he'll be deported. In the past month, he says he's worked at four or five different farms. Are you frightened of that you might get sick? No, no, gracias por la gracia de Dios. No, at the moment I'm not scared, thank God, because to me it doesn't exist so far, he says. No existe según para mí. Around 1,000 workers have tested positive on farms so far, but this number tells us little about the health of undocumented workers. It is a different uh, level of barriers for those who are, who are not currently documented as workers here, and, and the biggest impediment there is they don't have OHIP coverage, and so their assumption is that uh, this type of testing is not available to them. Testing is available for everyone, but that message may not be getting through. Susanna and Tanya here from undocumented workers fearful not of COVID, but of coming forward. They're scared that once they find out who they are and that they're not supposed, to, that they are undocumented, that they're going to get deported. For many, it comes down to a choice between their own health and supporting family back home. There's always work to be done, often with few questions asked. Jonathan Gatehouse, CBC News, Leamington. Now, the two women in that piece, Susanna and Tanya, who are making all those meals for migrant workers, they've decided not to open their Mexican restaurant just yet, saying it doesn't feel worth the risk. They say they're also still in touch with many migrant workers who've told them not much has changed since on those farms. Next on The National, a moment you can get up and dance to. We kind of like did the woo-hoo and he did the woo-hoo back and then we danced together for about 20 minutes. <laughs> So this magic moment between strangers has been seen <laughs> by millions online. Their story like, right after so this. With, like, I don't know. Daniel Odger Stedman is just 17 years old, but his dance moves apparently are now legendary after he turned his construction job into a bit of a party. And thanks to our CBC North colleagues who posted and shared that video, the viral video of Daniel dancing now has over 3 million views. The story behind that is our moment. We pulled up to the construction and saw the sign guy breaking it down pretty much. <laughs> we kind of like did the woo-woo and he did the woo-woo back and then we danced together. We thought, okay, why are we not videotaping this? <laughs> this is so funny. <laughs> Someone loves his job. Yeah. I think we posted it and just thought that our friends would find it really funny. And then CBC North called and put it up on theirs and they've got millions of views now. Ever since it blew up, I kind of just kept dancing every single day. I didn't think any video of me would go viral. <laughs> A lot of people joke around in comments and stuff saying that, uh, the dancing's keeping the bugs off me, but really it does. He had a bug net on just his head, so a hat. And for some reason he pulled it up and then the whole time he had it up. With people feeling so disconnected from each other, there's a real connection in that video. I mean, Daniel's standing in 30 degree weather with a whack of bugs doing a job that not a lot of people would desire. And he is just yeah. making the best of it. So here's a little secret about that. Yes, he had the bug net up, but he did that because he wanted to see the women in the car. He said. <laughs> Smart guy. Uh, but, but I mean, just to, to make the point clear, that ain't an easy job, no. right? I mean, he's, he's got to be standing out there in the heat 12 to 16 hours a day, we're told, guiding traffic, mm -hmm. an important job. Uh, again, not an easy one. So mad respect to that guy. You're going to dance soon? No. Okay. Just check it. <laughs> That's the National for this Wednesday, August 12th. Have a good night. Good night.